Damar, by far the best with knots, had been put in charge of tying the unconscious smuggler to one of the rear utility seats on the bridge. It had taken all three of them working together to move the rather large and limp rose into position. Yella had sympathetically cringed every time they bumped the woman's head or limbs as they dragged her along. But there was no time to overly be careful. As Sella pointed out, the woman had held them hostage aboard her ship, so a few bumps and bruises seemed only fair. I think this mutiny is going really well, said Damar, as he finished securing Rose's hands. Now all we have to do is calm someone to rescue us, said Yella, striding towards the control terminal. You're supposed to ask my permission, said Selen. It was my mutiny, so I'm the captain now. Selen had been quite brave and daring during their escape, thought Yella. Maybe she deserved to be called captain for a bit. Permission to use the comms, captain? Permission granted. Actually, I don't think it is, said Yella, tapped the repeatedly on the terminal, but it remained dark. The comms, flight controls, n none of the external controls terminals are responding. Damar and Selen rushed to the terminal console, tried to activate it themselves, but nothing worked. Did the air leak break it, asked Damar. I don't think so, said Yella. Otherwise, Selen wouldn't have been able to use the security controls to free us from the cargo hold. Plus, you can see the processing lights on the side activate when I press the surface. No, I think the main screen must be locked. What a dirty trick, said Selen, pounding her small fist angrily against the terminal. Careful, you might break... <clears throat> Yella paused men's sentence as she noticed a small hatch shake loose on the side of the main terminal. What's that? Selen lifted the terminal cover on the hatch. Inside was a number pad. That's just like on the crates in the cargo bay, said Damar. You think the computer leads to a secret treasure, too? He looked down at the furry sniplet perched on the shoulder of his pressure chute. Hear that, Rodin? Maybe there's another sculpture for you to eat. Try using the code 2380 again, instructed Yella. Selen entered the digits. But all that happened was that little light on the pad flashed red. I don't understand. Why didn't it work this time? Because a good smuggler is a paranoid smuggler, a deep, raspy voice informed them from behind. The children turned to see Rose had awoken. The woman glared at the children with a pained expression on her face. I'll give you the atmosphere thing. It was a good trick. Give me one beast of a headache. The large woman pulled on her restraints, testing their strength. Thankfully, Damar's knots held. But fun times are over. There's no way you're going to figure out how to unlock the main ship controls. And even if you did, it wouldn't do you any good. Do you even know where we are? Look outside. Look out there. She gestured with her hand to the cockpit glass. Outside was a darkness, spattering of twinkling stars, but little else. You know why I chose this spot? Because it's thousands of clicks from the closest anything in Croshaw. No one's going to find you here. Trust me. My specialty is flying under the radar. Plus, since you decided it would be such a good idea to completely vent the atmosphere, I'd say we only have a few more hours of breathing left. Think you can find help by then? Yella crossed over to the life support monitor. Rose was telling the truth. Their oxygen supply was severely depleted. So much for her brilliant plan to save her siblings. See? Your best bet is to untie me right now. You do that, I promise I'll take you back to Seoul. How about it? We have an accord? Maybe we should, said Damar. I don't want to run out of oxygen. Ah, the sniblet, said Rose, noticing the little creature on Damar's shoulder. I was wondering how you got out of that hold. Smart. I definitely underestimated you three. Now untie me before I lose my patience. You're underestimating us again if you think we're going to untie you just like that, said Yella, stepping proactively in front of Damar. Tell us the code first, and then we can discuss the terms of your release. See, that's what I'm talking about. Smart. But I'm smart too. I know my negotiation history. The Helberg Treaty. The Erling Lester Moot. All the same. 
I tell you the code, and then you have no reason to let me go. So why would I do that? Selen stepped over the alcove and back of the bridge and pulled out the formidable rifle Rose kept stored there. Though it was almost as long as she was tall, she managed to hoist the end of the barrel up so it was aimed squarely at their captive. Because I'm the captain now, and you have to do what I say. Yella almost couldn't believe what she was seeing. Selim was always quick to take action, but this? Damar summed up Yella's feelings succinctly when he said, Wah! Tell us the code. Rose's response was not what Selim was expecting. The smuggler grinned down at the little girl and the massive gun. Nice try, little girl, but the rifle? Nothing but a family antique. My great-grandfather brought it home from the Unification Wars. Has it worked in centuries? I just keep it around to scare people like you. Don't believe me? Give it a squeeze. Selen had thought just to scare the smuggler with the gun. But now the woman was taunting her. Rose had kidnapped them, threatened their lives, and even though she had tied to a chair, she was acting like she was running things. Like they were just some kids she could boss around. Selen hated when adults thought they could do whatever they wanted just because they were bigger and older. If she had to follow the rules and be nice, why didn't they? Whether the gun was broken or not broken, Selen didn't really care. One way or another, she was going to make Rose listen. Fine, I will. Selen aimed the gun at Rose's left boot and reached for the trigger. But before she could attempt to fire, Yella put her hand on sister's shoulder. Selen, wait. Selen didn't want to wait. Her brother and sister's lives depending on getting that code. She had to protect her family. We have to get the code. It's the only way. For what seemed like a very long moment, Yella thought about stepping back and letting Sella do things her way. With the atmosphere running out, the stakes were truly dire. Shouldn't they do anything in their power to get that code? But then she thought about what would happen afterwards. What would her brave and bold sister be like then? She thought about the time they were visiting Baba and they had a credit shit on the floor in the market they found. After they found the money, they wanted to keep it at first, but Baba asked them, do you know who Tip Top Tubber is? The children hadn't, so Baba explained that Tip Top Tubber was the best, most kind, most brave, most clever human that ever lived and ever would. Whenever I'm not sure what to do, I think about what Tip Top would do it. Figure it's good enough for him, being the best human and all, it's good enough for me. We can get out of this. We can do it the right way, said Yella. She turned to her brother. Damar, what do you think Tip Top would do if they were trapped in a ship, losing air? Damar thought a second before answering. Well, I'm not sure. Tip Top probably wouldn't hurt someone. Definitely not someone tied to a chair. What do you think, Selen? What do you think Tip Top would do? Selen hesitated. It had been years since she first learned about Tip Top and returning that nice woman's money. For the most part, they had outgrown the game. But hours they spent guessing and arguing about how the best human in the universe would tackle life's problems came back to her. With a sigh, Selen lowered the gun. Tip Top would figure out how to decode without hurting anybody using smarts. That's what I think, too. Want to help me? We're not untying her, though. Agreed. Not even Tip Top would trust her. Hey, protested Rose, but the children ignored her as they left the bridge and headed towards the adjoining crew quarters. Who the heck is Tip Top? We're looking for four numbers that would be very important to her. Something like her birthday or the last four digits in her registration, instructed Yella as she and her two siblings began searching through Rose's quarters. See if you can find anything that stands out. How do we do that in this mess? asked Damar, lifted up a discarded bag and peering at the small piles of coins scattered underneath. There's numbers everywhere. Damar picked up a hexagonal coin with a hollow center and inspected it. Seeing that the only number on it was five, he fed it to Rodin. The small creature hungrily munched on the metal. Clearly, it was starting to get its appetite back. You're wasting time, 
shouted Rose from the bridge. An oxygen! Four digit codes have thousands of possible combinations. You'll never guess the right one. 9,999, returned Damar. We already tried that one. And anyways, we don't need to guess. We're going to figure it out. Look for stuff that's out in the open, suggested Selen. I know at home the things I care about are usually on top of all the other garbage. Just like this. She held up a small glass sphere that had a hollow image frozen inside. It looks like Rose standing on a hole. Selen handed it to Yella so she could take a closer look. She's at a dig site. The label says graduate thesis, Kolkata. No number, but if she graduated from school, that year could be the code. See if there's a diploma or something about. You're way off track, shouted Rose from the other room. It's four random digits. Impossible to guess. Very secure. Not likely, said Yella, as she sorted through the contents of the disc. Our father taught a series of classes on xenocryptology, and I know that most passwords are inspired by personal significance. Truly random passwords are almost non-existent. In fact, 73% of all four-digit codes are years. Your other code, 2380, probably a meaningful year. Wrong. Oh yeah? That's why there is 2380 on that book, asked Damar, pointing to the shelf. Yella grabbed the volume in question. October 20th, 2380, a step too far. It's about the Stanley Mutiny. 2380 was the year the Unification War began. You said she had a lot of books about that, right? Yeah, more than any other. Seems like it's one of her favorite periods in history. Coincidence, yelled Rose. She said that the rifle was from the Unification Wars, too, said Selen. You're right. Her great something brought the gun back and when the war was over. All three children's eyes went wide at the realization at the same time. When the war was over! Yella quickly flipped open the book and scanned the dates they were looking for. Rushing back to the console, past the protesting rows, Yella entered 2384 into the number pad, the year the Unification War ended. And as if by magic, the main terminal sprang to life. Readouts and ship statuses alerts and flooded the screens. It worked! We did it! The three siblings embraced, celebrating the moment and feeling a sense of relief for the first time in what seemed like a very long time. Yella laughed as her cheek accidentally brushed against Rodin's furry body, and Selen grinned widely at the sight of Rose's displeasure. But we're not clear yet. Let's send out the distress comm and get rescued. Yella brought up the comm screen and began to scan for open channels in the area. Almost immediately, a ship popped up on notifications. I've got a contact. There's ship draft flying straight towards our coordinates. Of course it is, said Rose. I'm the one who told them to meet us here. Yella, Damar, and Selen stared through the cockpit glass at the small speck of light in the distance that marked a ship rapidly approaching their location. Yella's head swam. To go from this happy in one moment to being so full of dread was a lot for a heart to take. Hope you three are ready to spend the rest of your lives aboard a Banu ship, shoveling reactor fuel or whatever it is they do with their human servants, crowed Rose with obvious delight. She's lying again, said Sella. That could be any ship. Damar checked the scan info for the approaching vessel. It's a trip taker. That's a Banu model. You should have heard how excited they were when I told them you had three kitties on board. Who knows, maybe I'll sell them that gift you were so worked up about, since you won't be seeing your baba ever again. Of course, it's so nice, maybe I'll go ahead and keep it myself. Suddenly, the comms lit up. A hail was coming in. It was the Banu ship. Answer it, encouraged Rose. I want to say hi to my old friends. The comms chimed again. By now, the speck in the distance had begun to take on a rough shape of a ship. They were getting closer. We still have the rifle, said Selen. We could fight if they try to board. But Rose said the gun didn't work, pointed out Damar. She probably just wanted us to think that. Even if it was broken, the Banu don't know that. What if I fly us out of here, suggested Damar. I always wanted to be a pilot. I'm pretty sure I could learn how to do jump points. Maybe there's a manual Yella could read. The terminal rang once more, 
and the Banu ship continued to hail. I think we should answer the comm, said Yella with a surprising confidence. What? Why? Because it won't matter to them that Rose is tied up. All they'll want to know is who is in charge now, and that's us. Yella paused before admitting. Plus, I've always really, really wanted to meet the Banu. It would be pretty fun to meet a real alien, agreed Damar. And if they take us prisoner, we could always do another mutiny, muttered Selen. We are really good at them, aren't we? Okay, let's do it. Yeah, I trust you. With a deep breath, Yella pressed the control panel and answered the hail. On the screen, a Banu appeared. Leaning in too close to the camera, the alien's elongated and deeply rich face filled the image. Dark eyes twinkling, mouth spread with a wide grimace. The Banu said, Hello! Before Yella could respond, Roses strained forward against her bindings and shouted for the Banu's attention. Drafa, these little monsters kidnap me. You have to help. I'll give you anything you want. Drafa noticed the smuggler in the background. Oh, hello, Rose. Much sorry for a kidnap. Much luck to you. The Banu turned their attention back to the children. You are little monsters? Owners of the ship now? Yes, said Yella. Excellent. I will tell Pratu to have three doinyo ready for our negotiations. Wait, Drafa, you can't be serious, demanded Rose. Oh yes, Servant Rose, very serious. Every negotiation need on you. Helmets locked in place, Rodin securely stored inside Damar's suit, the three children waiting for the docking tube to pressurize. With a hiss, the hatch slipped open and Yellow crawled forward onto the ladder inside. Soon, she was less crawling and more pulling herself along as the less the gravity of the hauling ship was being left behind. Less and less gravity. Damar, who entered the tube second, gently bumped into her after using a bit too much force to propel himself into the low-G environment. Sorry! Past the halfway mark, the pulling turned into climbing as they aligned with the ship above. A few seconds later, Yella knocked on the hatch ahead. The bottom of the tube sealed. The pressure changed again, and the top dilated open. A grinning Banu face leaned over the hole, reached down to a longer-fingered hand, and assisted Yella in pulling herself up and into a grand main chamber of the trip-taker. Her heart raced as she touched the alien for the first time. Even through a pressure suit, it was extremely exciting. Yella immediately noticed the intricate, detailed work of the Banu craftsmanship glowing in the room's warm lighting. Different materials and patterns combined in a patchwork of crafting, curving, sweeping walls, which met in a high, pointed arch. Yella, you're going the wrong way, said Damar, waiting for his turn to climb out of the hatch. Nearby, Drafa, so tall that the crest on her head nearly touched the ceiling, stood proudly in the intricate woven robes, waiting to greet the children. Welcome to my ship. I am Esuli Drafa. The apprentice is Paratu, said Drafa, pointing to the other Banu who had helped him. It is an honor, a fortune, to have a luck to have you. May we all have riches on this day. Taking off her helmet and stepping forward, Yella swept outward with her chest with an open hand and carefully pronounced, Thank you. I am Yella. This is Daybar and Selen. Ged Anu Masasama. Drafa repeated the motion and responded, Masasama, you speak Banu very well, yes? Only a little bit my father taught me, said Yella. A little bit is a good place to start. Pratu only speaks a little human, but that is why apprentice. Pratu will learn. Pratu murmured something to Drafa and Banu. It was too fast for Yella to pick up any of the words. Ah, oh, yes, Slama nearly ready. Follow, we will drink and talk. Turning from the docking port, the two Banu led the way towards the narrow end of the chamber, where a lavish table, surrounded by a thick set of cushions, awaited. What Sloma? whispered Damar, once the Banu were a few steps ahead. It's a tea that Banu drink when they're making trades, answered Yella. I don't have to drink it, do I? Before Yella could respond, Drafa paused and brought their attention to a display of dozens of objects of varying shapes and sizes. Behold, these are treasures of my Soli, each a rare and useful item. We have made much wealth, 
and very good at trading. It is very lucky and fortunate that you will be trading with a Sully like ours. Yella leaned in to take a closer look. Some sparkled and bristled with spikes, but most of the items were beyond her knowledge. Damar pointed to the small machine on the lower shelves. Woo-wah! That's a GX microquamp! They stopped making those years ago! Yes, this is the first trade Partu made. Very good apprentice. Bad at talking human, but Paratu is excellent at appraising. Won't be apprentice long. Salen ignored the display and looked at the rest of the room. Where do you keep the slaves? she asked, still thinking about what Rose had said. Oh, little one, do, we do not have any. Is that why you were so eager to buy us? Selen, Yella scolded, but Drafa just shrugged. The truth of it is slaves are not our market. But Smuggler Rose had talked of having humans to trade. There is a slave solely in possession of a shield generator that I would very much like to have. I consider making a deal to trade with them, but no terms have been finalized. You good trade, said Pratu with big smile. What? Pratu is appraising you. Thinks you would be smart to have traded for you. Uh, thank you, said Yella. Selen roughly yanked her sister aside. Thank you? You're th talking about owning us. Don't worry, you heard Drafa. They're not slave traders. Partu was just complimenting us, saying that we're valuable people. Before Selen could utter a snarky response to come to mind, Damar excitedly said, What's that? The sisters looked over to see what their brother was pointing at, and a small, transparent cage of what looked like a purple crab with tentacles, instead of claws, perched inside a silvery nest. Ah, that is Nalgared. Very rare, very useful. See its web? Stronger than diamonds. Damar took Rodin out and held the sniplet up so all could see it. Look, Rodin, a new friend for you. Partu grew very excited upon seeing the creature in Damar's hands. Ridge nostrils flared. The Banu leaned in to look more closely. It's a sniplet. They are very rare and useful, said Damar, gently stroking Rodin's fur. This one's called Rodin. He saved our lives. Pratu gave a wide grin and said, Very good. Seated on the thick, comfortable cushions, Yella inspected the small cup of Drafa had given to her. Intricately carved and decorated with inlaid shell pieces, she had been very excited to learn it was called a Dunayo. Selen sat next to her, kicking her legs against the cushion. The formalities and pleasantries of negotiating with the Banu quickly were burning through her short supply of patience, though she did appreciate how nice it was to finally be out of that pressure suit. Partu placed a bubbling, meter-tall, shiny metal urn in front of them. Steam slowly rose from the spigots that adorned each side, releasing a woody fragrance into the air. Ah, the Slamodin. Wonderful. In honor of your first time on my trip, Taker, I have something special to brew. Drafa pulled out a little embroidered bag from their waist, binding and withdrew a bundle of dark petals bound into a very little sachet. This is flower of the back rose. I have tied it into the little bundle. Appropriate, yes? I think you will like very much. Pratu twisted open the Slamodin's hinge top and Drafa carefully lowered in the leaves. Do you have anything else you'd like to brew? Yella couldn't believe she hadn't planned ahead. She knew that Banu liked to drink tea and that it was customary for guests to bring something. But with all the excitement, it had slipped her mind. Here, said Damar, handing out a bitter melon drink that he had saved just in case. I wasn't going to drink it anyway. It struck Yella in that moment just how much she depended on her siblings. I don't think I could have gotten through any of this without them. Then again... I probably wouldn't have gotten into so much trouble in the first place, but, but still. This bitter melon drink represents the difficult path we took to get here, and our happiness at meeting you. Standing on her toes, she poured the contents of the drink into Salmodin. Good, said Drafa, as Partu closed the lid. Now raise your donio. Following the Banu's lead, Yella, Damar, and Selen held their cups beneath the spigots. Paratu pushed down on the top piping the hot tea through the system and filling all their drinking vessels. 
Gracio, a sans loma, Trinad, Drafai toasted, drink deep of me as I drink of you, and then tilted the cup back, tasting the mixture. Gracia, replied Yella, and then did the same. She nearly spit the stoloma out, but managed to swallow the mouthful. Zesty, she managed to mutter. This is an interesting brew, reflected Drafa. I do not like, but I am very glad to know the taste. It kind of tastes like that medicine Baba gave us when we had the shivers, said Selen, taking another sip. Damar scrunched his nose unhappily and smelled a waft of the scent. It smells like our cleaning bucket. Yella whispered to him, You don't have to drink all of it, but you do have to try it. Do you want to tell Baba you were aboard an actual, real Banu ship and didn't try their alien drink? Damar stared down at the daño, before closing his eyes and taking a tentative sip. Huh, it's sort of like Dangshin soup Dad used to get us during the winter. Drinking more, he added, but sort of sweeter. I like it. We half shared the Sloma. Now share with me what you want, Trafa said. We need a ride back to Seoul, responded Sela. You have a ship. Why do you not take this? We don't know how to fly it, explained Damar. Ah, I see. Then Rose, your servant, can take you, yes? She couldn't be trusted if we untied her, said Yellen. Ah, yes, yes, that, that is a problem, countered Rafa, stroking a long finger along their ridge. You really want to go to Seoul. You do not have a way of getting there. You know, I could get to Seoul with my trip taker. Very good ship. We were hoping you could take us. This is good. Trade us the sniblet, and we will trade you transport to Seoul. You can't have Rodin, protested Damar, grabbing the sniblet from the shoulder perch and holding him tight. But it is the sniblet we have come all this way for. Very rare, very useful. Damar, I'm sure we could. they'll take very good care of Rodin. Ah, yes, I will take very excellent care. Look at the ship, look at clothing, look at Pratu. This is very good solely. No, Rodin isn't something you can just trade. But we have to get back to Baba, said Yella. He's part of our family now. He's part of our family now. If we go to get back to Seoul, he's coming with. There's got to be something else we can trade, said Selen. Yes, yes. It is bad that you do not want to trade Sniblet. It was fair trade. See, you want us to fly to Seoul. Trip to Seoul is very risky for my Soli. See, not everything on Trip Taker allowed and sold by humans. We would be very careful. It is a very expensive thing you want. You could have Rose's ship, suggested Yella. Yes, if I was a ship trader, that would be good trade. But I am not ship trader. I only have one pilot. No one to fly that ship. Plus, much work to sell the ship. It is old ship too. Parts not worth much. No ship is bad trade for my Sully. What about other treasures? asked Amar. Treasure? repeated Partu. The very tall Banu could barely fit inside the cramped secret smuggling compartment beneath the hauling ship's cargo bay. Pratu held a pair of ancient goggles and inspected them closely, holding them in front of one eye than the other. No work. How is it that there's a room full of rare items and you don't want a single one? asked Ellen. Yes, maybe rare items. But they are not useful. What good to me are goggles that don't work? What good is painting of man with one ear? This map could be useful, but Baratu says the city doesn't exist anymore. Why would my Sully want any of these things? There's got to be something on this ship we can trade. Together, they walked through the ship as Baratu carefully appraised and evaluated. The cargo in the hull was worth enough but the trip-taker did not have enough room to carry it. The engine, the jump drive, the gravity generator, all could be removed and sold, but Drafa Sully did not have a mechanic who would be able to remove the parts carefully. Finally, they ended up back in Rose's quarters, but none of the historical artifacts had any appeal to the Banu. What good are books that talk about dead humans? Because if you don't study history, said Rose, as she stepped into the room holding the rifle, you are doomed to repeat it. 
Now all of you put your hands up. You said the gun didn't work, Selen pointed out. Rose revved the charging plate and the gun let out a high-pitched whine as the tip began to grow red. I lied. Last warning, get your hands up. How did you untie my knots? asked Damar as he raised his arms. I didn't. My ship just happens to be old and rusty. Wasn't too long before enough pushing and pulling broke the chair. Bad trade, noted Pradu. You're not kidding, bad trade. Still can't believe you double-crossed me like that, Trafa. Guess there's no such thing as thieves' honor with you cragheads. You are wrong. My Sully has most honor. Every trade we have done has been fair, and I kept my word. It is disgrace yourself. Do you not see we are the middle negotiation? If you wish to free yourself, do it on your own time. Rose shook her head in disbelief. Oh, that's it. I want you all off my ship right now. First things first, though. She swung the gun at Damar. You, give me back my sniblet. Damar looked down at his fairy friend and looking up at Rose's gaze. You want him? Here, you can have him. Damar held the sniblet out. Rose reached to grab down, but before she could, Damar stepped forward and pulled Rodin onto the barrel of the rifle. Before Rose had a chance to realize what had happened, the gun sparked and released a cloud of dark smoke. The sniblet had chewed through the metal. The smuggler squeezed the trigger, but nothing happened. Guess you weren't lying about the gun not working and all, happily taunted Selen. Why, you little... Rose threatened as she menacingly stepped forward, but before she could do anything, Partu interposed and drove the palm of their hand into her jaw. Just like that, Rose collapsed into a pile on the floor. Unconscious for the second, Damar dropped on all fours and quickly found where the sniblet was still happily munching away on the rifle. You saved us again, Rodin. That was quick thinking, Damar, said Yella. You were right that we could have never trade Rodin away. Selen looked up at Partu and all. Can you teach us to fight like that? The Banu grinned down at her. Trade? Help teach Partu human? asked Partu. Deal, replied Selen. I am happy that one trade has been made. I think I see another. If you give us the smuggler Rose, we shall take you to Seoul. She knows much about finding rare items and would be a good addition to my Soli. You mean like a her being a slave? asked Yella. Yes, until she can earn her freedom. She is good at treasures, so it will not take long. That be awesome, said Selen, but we can't. Humans are not for trading. Even ones like Rose, it's not the tip-top way. Then I am afraid negotiation almost over, said Drafa sadly. It is bad that weapon was destroyed. That would have been worth trip to Seoul. Rare and useful. Except against sniblets, apparently. But there does not seem to be anything left on the ship to trade. There's one more thing, said Yella quietly. She strode over to her sister. But I will only trade it if you and Damar say it's okay, Selen. Yella had braced herself for an argument. But to her surprise, Selen simply opened her backpack, removed the gift for Baba, and handed it over. Damar! I think Baba would want us to come home more than she'd want a gift, no matter how perfect it is. And I'm pretty ready to go home. Yella held the gift out to Pratu, who leaned in and inspected it. Oh, this is very good trade. May I see it? asked Rafa, taking gift from Yella. Oh, yes, very rare, very useful. We take this, we take you to Seoul. Fair trade? The ride to Seoul felt much quicker than the jump to Croshaw. For one thing, that they had jumped once before, they didn't feel as sick as they went through. Though, what really helped is that there were plenty of things to keep them busy aboard the trip taker. Selen struck her deal to give Pratu human lessons, teaching the different words for the body parts that the Banu was teaching her to hit. Yella spent the entire trip back with Drafa, going over each and every item of the Banu's collection. She learned quickly that Isasoli couldn't answer who made something or when it was made, but that Drafa could describe in minute detail how each of the rare and useful items worked. Yella could not wait to tell her dad everything she learned. Damar tried his best to get Rodin 
and the Nelgar to be friends, but in the end, since the two kept hissing and sniffing at each other, decided his efforts would be better spent trying different Saloma brews. Before they knew it, they were back at the transfer station, Bonnaroo, where their adventure had started. It was strange for Yella to see the station again. She remembered when their transport had approached Banaru, and it seemed so impressive, but now, as the trip-taker approached on their vector, it seemed so different. Yellow thought about how, in the third book of the House of Ashen Grey, Lord Felton returns home after the Battle of Hammerforge, surprised to find that life had continued on just the same while, uh, while he was away. When they requested docking permission, they got stopped and scammed by local authorities. Drafa was worried about some of the more illicit items would be discovered, but as soon as Yella mentioned her name, they were granted priority clearance. It turns out Baba had everyone on high alert looking for her missing grandchildren. They didn't take two steps into the station before they were scooped up in a big hug. Baba squeezed each one of them so hard they couldn't breathe, and then she did it again. Tears ran down her weathered cheeks, and soon all four of them were crying together, so happy to be reunited. But after wiping away the tears with the soft sleeve of her thick sweater, the smile melted from her face. She stood up to full height, which, though it was only a little bit taller than Yella, seemed a lot taller to the stern expression etched on her face. You all had me worried. Something pretty terrible. The security cameras clocked you going onto that ship, but it turned out the registration had been faked. No one had any idea where you would have wound up, and everyone seemed to think the space is too big to go running all over looking for three lost young ones. I was about to buy my own ship and start hunting for you when you turned back up with those Banu. We're sorry, said the siblings. Save your sorries till you're after telling me what the verse happened to you three. And so they did. They told her about the mean man on the shuttle her, and losing all the chocolates and, and sneaking off to find the new gift and almost solving the lockbox, about getting lost, and then kidnapped, and then finding the treasure and the sniblet rode in, and then launched a mutiny, cracking the computer code, and then negotiating with the Banu, and then Rose escaping and how they eventually traded the gift, and finally flying home back to Seoul. All in all, it took them almost two hours and a very large ice cream sundae to get through the full tale. Through it all, Baba just sat there, watching each one of the children take over parts of the story from their perspective, a slight smile on her face, until they were done. Baba, I won't lie and say that I'm not mad at you sneaking off in the first place, but you three acquitted yourselves quite well when things got tough. You were clever, brave, loyal, and I couldn't be more proud of you. We're sorry we had to trade away your gift, Yella replied. But don't you want the other gift we got you, Baba? Damar reached under his shirt and pulled Rodin from where he had been staying warm. You're giving me a sniblet? Well, he's part of the family now, and... You've always had a way how you wished family would visit more. Plus, I figure he could help by working he eat scrap metal and stuff. That's a great idea, Damar, said Yella. Rodin would be very happy living with Baba. And we could visit Rodin when he came to see Baba, said Selen. Damar reached out. The little furry creature eagerly crawled from his hand to Baba's. I don't know what to say. He's perfect. Thank you, Baba stroked Rodin's back. But you know, you didn't have to get me anything. Getting you back safe and hearing all about your adventure is just about the best gift I could have asked for. She hugged her three clever, brave, and loyal grandchildren. Now, what say you three to us getting out of here and heading home to Europa? Actually, there's one more thing I have to do before we go, replied Yella her mind once more thinking about the Banu lockbox waiting at Vasco's stall and all the new tips Drafa taught her. Gift for Baba Part 3. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it was a little emotional for me. <laughs> Which is bizarre to say. Uh, it's kind of hard to edit when you're uh, when you're trying to get into the story. 
but I, I did have to stop it once to get things right. Um, I wanted to thank you for sticking around this far. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my long-term subscribers. Thank you so much for sticking around. I make this content for you and because I enjoy making it, to be blunt. <laughs> Uh, this has been an adventure over like, I don't know, a 24 hour period recording all three of the parts. If there's enough interest, I might piece together all three into like one video, I guess. I don't have the originals anymore. These things are pretty heavy and big, um, even with my hard drive backup and everything. So, uh, I would just be using the, the finished copy that I then upload to YouTube, but I could do it. And the quality is 192 kilobytes. So it's probably just as good as my microphone and my, uh, my DAC put out. Okay, uh, that'll do it for me. <laughs> uh, I thank you all once again for sticking around. If you're pre-IAE this year when you're hearing this, um, I'm going to be doing a lot of videos about that. I'm going to be covering a lot of other things. So I'm not just going to be filling my content with lore, but I do have a ton of back catalog I'd love to practice on, get some audio on, especially some of them I passed over before. This is one of those. I passed over this wonderful story because it was so intricate, so large, so big scale. And also because there's multiple characters. I think I'm starting to realize that I, when I can voice act them, I do. When I just add some emphasis on certain things to try to make it clear which character's talking, like in this case, that's what I do. Um, and yeah, I have a big surprise coming up very soon. Well, decent size surprise. <laughs> uh, I have a, a, an old time contributor that I've, I've, I've done many performances with um, who is going to come on board. I'm not telling you who it is. Uh, but be prepared for that lore post. Um, so we're going to do a nice interview, a two-up interview. It's going to be really fun. A short one, but um, should really up the uh, the the, the uh, believability and, and the cool aspect of it. And also, uh, this this article, one more time. A Gift for Baba was originally a CIG text-based production by their CIG lore team. It was originally a jump point 5.10 for the part three. Uh <sighs> And also the original artwork that you see in this video was also from the CIG lore post uh, by Sean Andrew Murray. Uh, all three of the posts were pulled from the public side, from the comlink section. I have links below for each one of them, for each one of the parts of the story. And then I have a pinned comment that also links in where the uh, other parts of the story are if you're too far ahead. So if you're in part three and you need to get to part two, vice versa, you're in part two, wondering where part three is, that's it. Okay, uh, thank you all and fly safe.